a lot of different studies have shown that successful businesses and enterprises tend to have a combination of what we might call big picture people and detail oriented people. The big picture folks tend to be people who have grand imagination, people who are creative, who can see into the future and imagine something new coming into existence. While those detail oriented folks have the capacity to put that idea into practice to make the machinery run, to build the structure that is needed. Big idea folks without detail folks may have grand schemes that never get off the ground, while those who are detail oriented might maintain systems that can lose their purpose, their identity, their impact, because no one's really looking beyond the details themselves. I think this combination of having a big picture and detail-oriented folks might be the reason why we have a diversity of Gospels in the Christian Scriptures. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in some ways, we might call detail-oriented depictions of the reality of Christ. For example, Matthew in chapter 1 says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. So he narrates what happens in terms of uh, Joseph having thoughts to divorce Mary, angels being sent, them heading to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod. Luke also has some details he puts in there about shepherds and angels and the ways that things happen in Bethlehem. John, however, was the big idea, gospel writer. He doesn't tell us anything about how Christ was born because I don't think he's that interested in the details. What he wants to do is to share with the world why Christ was born. He pulls back the veil that separates the divine mind, shares the reason why Christ came to us. John begins his gospel by offering that grand and cosmic vision of why the birth of Christ is indeed worth celebrating. Listen now for God's word to you as I share these opening verses from God. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. The Word became flesh, lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law, indeed, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. May God bless for hearing, for living this reading from God's holy word. Though children around the world have eight more days to hold it all together, to please Santa, to be good little girls and boys. I don't recall exactly from my childhood what happens after Christmas arrives, where there's sort of a moment of release, like, oh, good, now I get to be bad for a while because I've been trying to do this so hard for a while. 
But even though there might be a momentary release from the pressure of being good, we know that Santa's ethic actually lives on within us. The Santa code that really, I think, provides a basic moral framework that we learn early in life, that we are rewarded when we are good and we are punished when we are bad. It's kind of the way the world works, right? That our behavior determines what we receive. And indeed, if you look in the Old Testament, in some ways, God is very Santa-esque, seems to me. God tells the Hebrews over and over, I'm watching you. And if you do well, if you follow my laws, if you worship me, if you keep my commands, and things will go really well for you, you'll be blessed with long lives, have prosperous fields. But... But if you're bad, if you disobey my laws, if you turn away from me, things will not go well for you. It's a basic covenant called the law where you are rewarded when you obey things and you are punished when you disobey. And we learn that early in life that that's a basic moral framework that's sort of meant to guide how we move through the world. Indeed, the writer of John's Gospel puts it this way. You know, he, he shares that we are people in whom that the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law was given through Moses, and the law is this basic Santa code, this basic moral framework that gets embedded early and deeply into our lives. Indeed, I would say it's the foundation of Western culture. The law that we have, the laws that we pass, are meant to help us not to be naughty to each other. If we are naughty, if we're not nice, if we do things that harm our neighbors, then we are going to suffer the consequence of behaving badly. We follow the law, stay out of jail, then we have the capacity to have lives that are meaningful and profound. And so we are very used to this kind of idea that Santa embeds within us early in life, that we are meant to be good, not to be bad, and our giftedness, our, what we receive, is based on that. And so in some ways, we're used to Santa. We know his, his, his gig. We understand his reason. But the one whose birthday we are really celebrating, he's a bit harder to figure out. What was he all about? I think that's what John is trying to unpack in the very beginning of his gospel, going back to that verse. The law was given to Moses, hard stuff. Grace and truth, they've come through Jesus Christ. John's saying there's a big change happening right now. A whole different way of knowing God is now being offered. The law has its purpose. But now God decided something new, revolutionarily new, was needed really to express the reality of what God wanted to experience with humanity. Maybe God was sort of tired of being Santa Claus-like. He wanted something else, something different, something deeper with all of us as children of God. And so Christ came to begin to implement this radical new perspective. Jesus came indeed to offer something profoundly unique, and John describes it this way. He says, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a spouse's will, but born of God. He came to change the entire paradigm of what it means indeed to be human. He was not trying to sort of spiff us up, to let us be a little less naughty, a little more nice. He didn't come with that limited perspective. His goal was not to dust us off, to make us better mannered, to make us pay our taxes on time and to obey all civil laws. He had something so much more in mind for us and trying to get us to be good little boys or girls, good little men and women, and all genders in between. He had something far different in mind. He came, John says, to give us this right, this opportunity, this profound privilege to become human in a radically new way. 
He came to define, indeed, possibilities of what it means to be human. Prior to Christ's arrival, we were all basically incarnations of our families, our cultures, our own internal desires and wants. But Christ came, John says, to allow us to become something and someone utterly different, to become what he labels as children of God. To become part of God's family. And indeed, to share even more deeply in the, the very divine nature of who God is. When our, our own human children carry within them our DNA, they carry within us our teachings, they carry within us our history, our perspectives, our values, they are walking around with our reality within them. And Christ is saying, so too, when you are children of God, you're called not just to have a belief in God, you're called indeed to be people in whom God's very nature now dwells eternal. Some of our ancestors in faith put this truth so boldly that it sounds shocking to me, even now. The church father, Athanasius, pondered John's words and made this bold assertion. He said, he became what we are so that we might become what he is. Wow. He became what we are so that we might become what he is. Athanasius, by the way, was not a heretic. He is indeed a revered father of the faith. And about a thousand years later, at the Council of Nicaea, so eight centuries later, St. Thomas Aquinas took Athanasius' words and extended them even further, I think. He said these words. He says, the only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. That was not said by Shirley McLean. That was said by St. Thomas Aquinas, again, one of the few doctors of the faith who said Christ became what we are, that we will become what Christ is, that we are called to be full partakers in the divine nature. Sam is not thinking along those lines, right? Sam is thinking, be a little bit better, a little bit nice. Christ is thinking, I want you to become people in whom the very Spirit of God dwells fully and eternally, just like he does in me. You think, wow, are they, are they basing that on anything that's scripturally based? Jesus in John's Gospel says, I have given them, meaning us, I have given all of them who follow me the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. I in them, you in me. There is this mutual indwelling that Christ points to that says that as Christ dwells within us, we share in the very nature and the glory of Christ in that sense of deep communion with God. The Apostle Paul put it this way, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ now is the one that is living within me and through me. It's this incarnation of Bethlehem, Paul says, has happened now in my life. And that is indeed what this whole celebration is about, that the Christ who was born then continually yearns to become people who so are filled with Christ that we can also begin to move to the place of saying, it's longer we who live, but Christ. Christ who lives within us, which is the greatest and the grandest idea that God has ever had. I will allow these creatures that I have formed to be people in whom my spirit, my presence, my son will dwell forever. God says, Merry Christmas. That's my gift to you. That possibility, that, that invitation, that desire. As I said, when I, when I read these words, some part of me still instinctively steps back. No, that, that, that can't be right. That feels too much. It feels, it feels like blasphemy. It, it feels way beyond, you know, what, what's possible. So maybe all of us find it easier to celebrate 
follow Santa's code. Let's just try to be a little bit nicer. Let's try to gin up some better behavior. Let's try not to be so naughty in the new year. Let's try to just be sort of better versions of our old self if we can pull it off. That seems safer. That seems easier. That, that seems something I can do. But this, the idea of God, he became what we are, that we might become what he is, What do you do with that? What can that look like? What does it mean that Christ wants my brain to become the mind of Christ? That Christ wants my body to become the temple of the Holy Spirit? That Christ wants, indeed, my will to be guided and led by his good and perfect will? That God's heart, God's very heart, would beat inside of my chest? What does that look like? What does that mean? If I say yes to that, if I accept that, get the I say yes, Lord, let it be so to me. What might happen to how I live, how I see things? I might be compelled to, to begin to love people that right now I don't find very lovable. I might be called to start loving enemies, for goodness sake, just the way that Christ did. I, I might be moved to start praying for people who, who persecuted me. Because God's heart is beating in my heart, and that's what God wants me to be doing. And maybe God will start making me care more about justice and care and equity. That God will want me to move against those things that are systemically oppressive, because that's what God has always stood against, forever and ever. Maybe, maybe if I allow this Christ to really be born in me, Everything might change. I might begin to see the world as Christ sees the world. And every day I awake, Christ's will will be my will. And I'll find myself living in this grand story of a God whose extravagance moves me to tears and praise and victory. In Christ, we see that God's not playing around. God never has small ideas. God only has these big, glorious, divine aspirities. The one, the greatest one was that he became what we are, that we might become what he is. And John says, I understand that people may not want to accept this. He says, no, Christ came to his own people, and they didn't want him. He came to his own church, and they tried to kill him. He came to his own faith, and they're Religious leaders wanted, indeed, to crucify him, which they did. They didn't want the offer to become what he is. They wanted to stay in how they were. They wanted to stay in their own power struggles, their own small-mindedness, their own ways of being tribalistic. They wanted to stay in lives that were small and conflicted and fear-filled. Why? I don't know. Maybe because it's easy. Maybe it's because we're, we're, we're used to it. choosing safety and smallness, honoring centuries-old hatreds, looking for the worst in other people. Maybe that's so ingrained within us that we actually need, indeed, something of the divine magnitude to change it, which is, indeed, the gift of Christ. I understand there's part of us that might want to say, no, I'm going to settle for something less. I'm going to choose to, to follow Santa's code. What a tragedy that would be. What a tragedy to spend our one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver says, settling for something that's so much less than what God wants for us. He became what we are, that we might become what he is. One of my very favorite Christian authors wrote these words. He says, what blindness it is to fear to advance too far in the love of God. Isn't that beautiful? What blindness it is to fear to advance too far in the love of God. Let us plunge into it, he writes. How can we fear to feel ourselves too full of it? Are we afraid of being too happy to feed from ourselves, from the whims of our pride, from the violence of our passions, and from the tyranny of a deceitful culture? 
May we, why do we delay to throw ourselves with full confidence into the arms of the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation? Why? It's Christmas season. Let us indeed remember that Jesus came. He came. We are, that we might become what he is. May we open that gift, marvel at it, celebrate it, and embrace it, and choose it, embody it, today, tomorrow, and indeed forevermore. Amen.